Welcome once again to Lato's Law. Here's Steve Lato. I did a video recently about the FAIR Act in Washington, and that's the federal legislation that's proposed to change how civil asset forfeiture is handled by the feds. And uh, I said, I think it's a good thing. I think many of my viewers will think it's a good thing also. So I said, you should contact your people in Washington and let them know that you are in favor of the FAIR Act, especially in an election year. So I said also, however, in the previous video, that one of the problems we've got is that while a lot of people are for this statute and changing the law, there are big organizations that are against it, and they're organized quite well. And one of those organizations is the National Sheriff's Association, who sent a letter, which I have in my left hand. And this letter was sent to the House of Representatives, and the copy I've got here addressed the Honorable Dan Crenshaw. So you might say, Steve, the National Sheriff's Association is against fixing or changing how civil asset forfeiture is done what are their objections? Well, there's three pages here. Three pages, although I admit the third page is largely a uh, set of sources, almost like endnotes or something. But I'll read it to you. Here's what it says. Regarding, please preserve a critical tool to fight the drug cartels and vote against H.R. 1525, which is the Fifth Amendment Integrity Restoration or FAIR Act of 2023. Dear Representative Crenshaw, Despite the fact they are killing hundreds of Americans daily, H.R. 1525, the FAIR Act, would largely dismantle a crucial tool in the fight against the Mexican drug cartels, federal civil asset forfeiture, period. That's the first sentence. So apparently, Mexican drug cartels are who they're going after when they take money off a person in an airplane in Atlanta. Because that's how they start the letter. Despite the fact they're killing hundreds of Americans daily, H.R. 1525, the Fair Act, would largely dismantle a crucial tool in the fight against the Mexican drug cartels, federal civil asset forfeiture. So when they pull a motorist over in the upper peninsula of Michigan, five miles from the Canadian border, and take money from that person, they're apparently fighting a Mexican drug cartel. For example, H.R. 1525 would repeal equitable sharing, which is the cornerstone of state and local participation in joint operations with federal law enforcement, especially on task forces such as the HIDTA. On behalf of the nation's 3,086 sheriffs, the National Sheriffs Association therefore asks you to vote against H.R. 1525. So they're saying, look, and by the way, they're going to take the money from the civil asset forfeitures that still take place, and put them in the general fund. And he's saying, yeah, it's a he. He's saying, I was about to say or she, but I realize this is an actual person who wrote the letter. He's saying that they need that money. That's a cornerstone of what they're doing. But remember, they keep the money to fund themselves to take more money. But it's a cornerstone. I was not the first person to point this out. But if you watch the great piece that John Oliver did on civil asset forfeiture, there are examples of sheriffs and other police officers buying things like daiquiri makers and um, commemorative badges to hand out or tickets to the Super Bowl with the money they got from civil asset forfeiture. So if you think that daiquiri makers are a cornerstone of law enforcement, you might be in the wrong line of work, my friend. So especially after 9-11, so we, have to, we have to invoke... 9-11, somehow. Especially after 9-11, the public rightly demands more federal, state, and local cooperation, not less. So they're suggesting that after 9-11, the public wants more civil asset forfeiture. Especially after 9-11, the public rightly demands more federal, state, and local cooperation, not less. Now, if, if cooperation is the sharing of the money seized and stolen from people, I, I, I guess I understand where you're get, going with that. But nonetheless, H.R. 1525 would repeal equitable sharing, the cornerstone of some of the most successful joint operations against the drug cartels. Repealing equitable sharing will not promote civil rights, vindicate the Fifth Amendment, or protect property owners. Yes, it will. Are you trying to tell me that you've never seized money from an innocent person? Ever. See, that's the kind of hubris, and I bet I've never used that word in a video before, that makes you really wonder about somebody and the job they're doing. 
if they honestly think that they've never seized money from an innocent person. Because we know they have. They've done it many, many times. Many times. But it would be a big victory for drug lords and other organized crime. Drug lords. See, we have to throw these words around. Drug cartels and drug lords and other organized crime. And instead we have the record producer getting on an airplane in Atlanta to fly to L.A. to go work on some music. Or we've got the man driving across country to bring money to his daughter. And he is a, uh, he, he's a Marine who served his country. And the police officer actually says, well, I'm going to take your money. You know, I'm sorry. And they take his money. Didn't do anything wrong. And they gave his money back to him as soon as it got publicized. Are you trying to tell me that he was a drug lord or organized crime or a member of a Mexican cartel? And it's... <clears throat> I'll keep reading. H.R. 1525 proposes other bad amendments as well. For example, it shortened the government's time to notify a potential property owner. (laughs) I got news for you. They owned it until you took it. They're not a potential property owner. If you take this from me, I'm not a potential property owner. I'm the property owner. You stole it from me. It would shorten the government's time to notify a potential property owner of a forfeiture proceeding from 60 days to seven. And they italicized seven like that's outrageous. <laughs> seven. And it's time to file a complaint from 90 days to 30. Those radical reductions won't improve justice because they're far out of step with usual civil procedure time frames or deadlines. Guess what? If you take my money from me and... I have to wait 90 days versus 30 days to do something. That significantly harms me, even though you only think I'm a potential property owner. These rules, they're designed to choke down the use of civil asset forfeiture, regardless of the merits of a case or seizure. Yes, they are. Guidelines are. Rules are. They are there to choke it down to where it makes sense. So if you take my money from me and you don't have to notify me for two months and then say that you have another 90 days to complain, to file a complaint about the money, uh, that's a lot of time for the potential property owner to be without their potential property. H.R. 1525 would increase the government's burden that property is subject to forfeiture or that it had a substantial connection to crime from a preponderance of the evidence standard to a clear and convincing evidence standard. But nothing about the nature of civil asset forfeiture demands this. Oh, how much do you think this sheriff, Sheriff Jim Skinner from Collin County, Texas, how much do you think he'd complain if someone took his stuff? Oh, oh, he'd be fine with it. He'd be willing to sit around four or five months while the paperwork got done to try to get his potential property back. Nothing about the nature of civil asset forfeiture demands this. A preponderance is the greater weight of credible evidence, and the fact finder is free to decide which evidence is credible and what testimony, documents, video, and other evidence add up the greater weight in each case. This allows for a nuanced review of the evidence and is fair. Most civil proceedings use this standard, including ones for the care of children, property valuation in eminent domain, contract disputes, and tax disputes. Under the existing law, the government bears a burden of proof to show that specific property is subject to forfeiture. And now here's the thing. They keep saying that, but that's never really how it's, how it's handled. They take your stuff and go, you want it back? Sue us or start the administrative proceeding. File your paperwork. When you're filing the paperwork and you're being asked to prove things, the burden of proof is on you. You can't just file your paperwork and go, fine, prove that money belongs to you. It's not how it works. Nonetheless, H.R. 1525 would shift the burden on the innocent owner defenses to the government as well. Oh, my gosh, the government would actually have the burden of proof to take money from a potential property owner. That is, the government would have to prove that a putative owner, a putative owner, as opposed to a potential owner, did not know of the conduct that subjects the property to forfeiture, or upon learning of the conduct, did not do all that reasonably could be expected to stop the conduct. 
Just as a defendant bears the burden of proof on an affirmative defense in a criminal case, however, a property owner should bear the burden on these affirmative defenses. Most of the time, the property owner will have a better access to relevant evidence, and shifting the burden would force the state to conduct intrusive discovery against owners. Oh, <laughs> you think that the owners are going to complain about the intrusive discovery when the hearing is finally fair? Financial institutions must file CTR reports in connection with deposits of $10,000 or more in cash, and federal law prohibits structuring transactions to evade such reporting requirements. So now he's giving them a lecture on banking law. Section 5A of HB 1525 would increase the government's burden to prove a structuring charge by inserting the phrase knowingly in each of the provisions, three parts, even though they already require the government to prove a culpable mental state, that is, that a defendant acted for the purpose of evading the reporting requirements. After the U.S. Supreme Court discussed the issue in January of 94, Congress amended the statute in September of 94 and October of 01 and addressed the mental state required for an offense. The state must prove a culpable mental state to secure a structuring conviction. I'm not worried about the structuring convictions. That Not a lot of people care about that. We're talking about civil asset forfeiture. A person must file a report when the person transports monetary instruments of more than $10,000 at one time across a U.S. border. And Treasury may apply for a search warrant when it reasonably believes that a money instrument is being transported without such a report or with a material omission or misstatement. A court may issue a warrant for a search of a designated person, place, or object, or in the case of a border matter, a search of a vessel, vehicle, aircraft, or other conveyance. The law also allows for civil forfeiture for some violation of these reporting and related rules. Section 5B of H.R. 1525 would require a court on a putative owner's demand to hold a probable cause hearing within 14 days to determine if there was probable cause to believe that someone violated an anti-structuring provision in connection with the attempted transport. If the court did not find probable cause, then the government would have to return the monetary instrument. Like H.R. 1525's reduction of other time frames, this provision would likely create another unrealistic deadline and choke down use of civil asset forfeiture to fight money laundering without regard to a particular case or seizure's merits. Again, I'm not terribly concerned about the structuring rules here, so ostensible reforms like 1525 rest on an incomplete picture of the fight against trafficking. Now just trafficking. Notice he didn't say what kind of trafficking. Are we talking drugs? Money laundering? Are we talking about human? What kind of trafficking are we fighting here? No one should support the egregious anecdotes of individual abuses, <laughs> seizures of real property, or vehicles for relatively minor crimes, or coercion of out-of-state travelers to surrender their cash with threats of criminal charges. No one should support the egregious anecdotes of individual abuses. He's actually saying, if you've heard these crazy stories, disregard them. The guy getting on the plane with his money taken, disregard him. The guy at the side of the road whose cash was taken, going to visit his daughter, the Marine, disregard him. No one should support the egregious anecdotes. I got news for you. You don't support something you heard about and believe in. You simply heard about it. And if it's stuck in your mind for a reason, it's stuck there for a reason. And to suggest you should forget those. Forget the abuses. Disregard the abuses. No one should support the egregious anecdotes of individual abuses. <sighs> but focusing on a few anecdotes results in bad policy. There's a concept, and I've heard it phrased many different ways. And it's often attributed to Blackstone, one of the earliest commentaries on the law. Blackstone was a, a, a legal scholar in the old days. He was one of the first people to put down in writing many of the concepts of the common law that became the basis of our legal system. And talking about juries, he said it's better to let 10 guilty people go free than to convict one innocent person. And I paraphrased that. So the question is, when you're fighting crime and you're using a dragnet approach and you're sweeping up all kinds of people, if you caught one bad person and you accidentally caught 10 innocent people, is that equation appropriate? Because this guy right here is saying, 
disregard those stories. Disregard them. Then he says, make no mistake, organizing third-party mules and couriers into discrete cells, the cartels smuggle bulk currency by passenger vehicle, tractor trailer, and boat, by package and parcel, and in disguised crates and concealed compartments. Now, he's using the weird examples. I've yet to hear a civil asset forfeiture case where someone's complaining, going, yeah, this guy had a mountain of cash, you know, on pallets in a semi. He's crossing the border, and his cash got taken. Let's rally behind him. Haven't heard that one. Mules transport large bundles of cash that are sorted, wrapped in plastic, and concealed. This cash isn't in a trunk safe, and the mule doesn't have paperwork for the recent sale of a home or a receipt of life insurance proceeds. But even when they pull somebody over who's got cash, because I've got the bank receipt right here. They still take the money. This, this, he, he's, he's, he's suggesting that they don't have the paperwork like the other people do. They disregard your paperwork if you've got it. They are key components of the cartel's money laundering efforts and joint operations between federal law enforcement with intelligence from cross-country and international sources and state and local highway interdiction teams are some of the best ways of fighting this trafficking. And H.R. 1525 would stop virtually all such operations. In the summary, Congress would give the cartels a gift by passing H.R. 1525, largely dismantling federal civil asset forfeiture and repealing equitable sharing, our terrible policy. Please vote against 1525, and thank you for your continued commitment to public safety and the nation's sheriffs. Sincerely, Sheriff Jim Skinner, Collin County, Texas. And I mentioned his name earlier, so I'll mention it again because he signed the letter. His entire point is that what we're doing works, and you don't want to mess it. You don't want to upset the boat here at this point. It works. Leave it. And by the way, what you're suggesting that we do would be so unfair that these potential property owners could complain and get their potential property back. Again, if it's mine, it's mine. If you steal it from me, it's still mine. I don't have possession of it, but I still own it. Theft doesn't change ownership. Many people have heard that the sheriff wrote a letter in opposition to this. And, of course, the letter is from the National Sheriff's Association. But when you read it, you realize that it falls apart almost immediately. Because he says things like, well, we're fighting Mexican drug cartels. Really? All the stories I heard didn't involve Mexican drug cartels. Well, you can't, you can't really put that much weight in these egregious examples. Uh, you, 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 you can't look at that. Why not? Why not? And then he says things like, well, you know, they're, they're all this well-organized stuff. And he keeps going back to, I'm assuming he's doing this because he's in Texas. Maybe that's why he's so hyper-focused on the Mexican drug cartels. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. But I will put a link to this letter in the description below this video. And as I said in the previous video, I urge you to contact your people, representatives and senators, in Washington and let them know that you've been very concerned about civil asset forfeiture for some time and you think they should support this bill. Support this bill and let them know that the people who support it outnumber the people who don't, the people with a vested interest. Because this sheriff gets to keep a portion of everything that his people sees. And he mentions the cooperation between different law enforcement agencies, between the states and the feds and the locals. And don't forget, that's how they pull off that little scam where they get to keep the money. Remember the stories? where the local people grab the cash and quickly hand it to the feds. So the people file a lawsuit against the people who took their money, and the court says, well, you can't sue them because they haven't got your money anymore. you got to sue the feds. So when you sue the feds, by that time they've given part of the money back, and, part of the, and then the feds defend it, because the feds have deeper pockets, apparently, and can fight it longer. And by the time they're done this shell game with the money moving around, a couple different agencies have got it. Nobody's given it back to you. And meanwhile, you've got to prove your innocence. So again, it's the FAIR Act, HR 1525. Write to your people, tell them you support it, and tell them to ignore the kind of hogwash written by the sheriff in this instance. There you go. Questions or comments, put them below. Let's talk to you later.
Thank you for watching Leto's Law. I've learned two very important lessons in my life. I don't remember the first one, and the second one is to write everything down.